Dear colleagues and partners, welcome to the session on Integrated Outbreak Analytics, or IOA. My name is Pascal Lissouba, working with Epicentre MSF, and I will be chairing on behalf of the core IOA team. We're extremely grateful for the opportunity to present and update you on the IOA initiative. The IOA core team is a multi-organization partnership represented today by Marie-Amélie de Gale from WHO, Dr. Esther Van Cleef from the Institute of Tropical Medicine of Antwerp, Dr. Christine Dubré from USCDC, Dr. Nia Hasting from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, Dr. Nina Gobat from WHO Gorn, Dr. Lina Moses from Gorn, Dr. Ruby Siddiqui from UNICEF Support to IOA Gorn, and Simon Carter from UNICEF. Simon will present, um, Simon who initiated IOA uh, will present uh, to us today well, we'll conduct a presentation on IOA. Um, first, she will detail the history of uh, how IOA came about, uh, what it is, and it's in unique and innovative ways of working with some testimonies and examples of successful IOA field applications. And lastly, and importantly, how GORN colleagues and partners can be involved. We will conclude our session with uh, some question and answer involving the entire core team. Thank you again for your attention. Simone, the floor is yours. Thanks, Pascal. Um, and hi, everyone. So yeah, just to start, um, for those who don't know, a recap of the IOA initiative, it's really an in-country initiative that was started when UNICEF set up the social science analytics cell uh, and the epi cell by the Ministry of Health was supported by WHO, UNICEF, uh, CDC, sorry, uh, and uh, MSF Epicent. Um, and so this cell was set up and which had terms of reference that were, um, signed off quite quickly within the first six months uh, to really conduct systematic and operational research to inform the response. Uh, this interest, integrated cell uh, was, was operational within the first six months. Um, by January 2020, that's moving too fast, um, by January 2020, um, with the support of donors from Welcome and FCDO, uh, we received a grant with Gorn Research and UNICEF to model the IOA approach for future outbreaks. And then of course, future outbreaks happened. So COVID happened very quickly thereafter. Um, and we did set up the cell. Um, sorry, just moving through this a little bit better. Um, and so we did set up the cell again for Iowa. At the same time under, um, or during the time of COVID in June, 2020, we set up an Iowa working group um, under GORN. And so this was really an opportunity to grow the Iowa model outside of the DRC. At the same time, inside the DRC, there was an IOA scale-up for other emergencies, including the plague and cholera. In March 2021, we set up an IOA cell in the Ebola response in Guinea, and this included GORN deployment specifically to IOA, so that was the first uh, GORN IOA deployment that took place. In June 2021, we had the core team um, who Pascal introduced really established under GORN, and we saw partner investment in terms of HR, um, additional teams being provided or individuals being provided from the partner organizations to make this initiative uh, really uh, concrete. And this work included developing uh, the terms of reference, which have been finalized in November and shared with all of you, um, providing additional support both remotely and field-based again for the IOA cell, which was set up for the most recent Ebola outbreak in um, Benny in the DRC and publishing our first IOA field exchange, which will be shared with you at the end of this week. So what, what is IOA? What does this really mean? So we're really looking at transdisciplinary integrated data to better understand outbreak dynamics and their broader impacts on communities. And so when we talk about the data that's involved in this, it would be program data. So that could be WASH data. So um, whether that is water availability at healthcare facilities in communities, uh, access to soap, uh, water, um, infection prevention control data. So um, everything that is programs that are supporting healthcare facilities or community-based IPC. It might be vaccine data for a uh, particular disease. So the number of men, women, children um, vaccinated for Ebola, but it also might be things like cash transfer activities. So that kind of information would inform um, or influence a health outcome or health behavior dynamic potentially. 
It also includes surveillance data. So understanding, of course, the contact tracing information, the number of cases by age, by sex, um, understanding healthcare services use and health outcomes. So this is the typical DHS2 or health systems services. So this might be the number of people using healthcare facilities or proportions of people using healthcare facilities for pre and postnatal care, routine vaccination coverage, or the number of malaria cases and how these might have changed over time. Um, so other health indicators and health services use. Um, and of course, per community perceptions and behaviors, which explain the other data that we see. Um, so, you know, what are individual behaviors around healthcare services use around access or uh, availability of healthcare services and that's collected through qualitative or quantitative interviews and finally while we recognize that healthcare workers are of course part of communities in outbreaks they are a particular group and niche and we really do need to engage in specific data collection around their perceptions of risk their knowledge their practice their perceived capacity to apply uh, prevention measures and so all of this is the data that kind of gives us the information in time of what is this context more holistically. But of course, that's only influenced by some other kinds of context. And that contextual data is things like the events, policies over time, when were, when were borders closed? Um, when did free healthcare uh, start or stop? Um, when did political events happen which may gain or, or lose trust in uh, particular leaders? Um, what are the price trends or changes in markets movements, uh, markets, sorry, and this might be, for example, the increased prices of all goods since COVID, including transport, which might then influence um, healthcare services use, uh, population movements, which might be the result of conflict um, or other displacement issues. And all of this also has to be looked at in the context of gender and social norms. And this is data uh, on context which influences the other data that we see um, and the outcomes of the other data that we will see in real time. And so we really need to take this all holistically to understand the whole picture um, of what's happening in community health, not just of the disease itself. And so what does that look like in practice? Um, we have a video from Matthias Masoko, who is the lead of the Iowa cell, um, both in the 10th and 13th Ebola outbreak. And so it's not just, of course, about uh, different pieces of data. Those are also not things that we hold each one of us on our own. So it's also about partnership and, and collaboration on this data sources. So to give you a very DRC example, these are the different actors that work together when we do IOA, depending on the study uh, or type. And it's all in support of the Ministry of Health. But working together might be through joint analysis through briefs, but we also host workshops looking at particular particular topics. Um, we might be holding debriefs, presentations, um, sessions of work together, but really trying to bring this data more holistically together. Um, it might even include different actors like NGOs providing us data and asking for support in analysis to better inform um, and support the Ministry of Health. And so what this does together under the Ministry of Health and in support of their programming, is allowing us to use data more holistically, more integratedly, to adapt strategies and activities, um, to advocate and redefine priorities, to implement completely new strategies and finance these new projects as well. Um, and it really is about, uh, you know, an integrated and transdisciplinary data with evidence based um, to support decision making for the Ministry of Health. Uh, in this way, working together, we also 
reduce duplication, and we really facilitate a better evidence use. And so it's it's not about you know just um, evidence generation. It really is about this evidence use. And so when we talk about the process of how we make sure that this happens, we we get a research question, and that might come from an epidemiological situation. It might be a request from commissions, Ministry of Health, uh, other NGO actors. We might see a question in existing data that isn't answered, or there might be a shift in context. And so we'll develop terms of reference, and this is operational. So it's it's terms of reference that are developed. Uh, one, two pages, and in 24 hours, 48 hours. Um, but the key part of this is to make sure that we can say how the data will be used and by who. Um, and if we can't do that, we won't collect the data. And this is what we try to do with all of the partners working together on this. And so then we, we aim to have the terms of reference are signed off uh, by the coordination, by commission, by local actors. So uh, recently we in the DRC, there's a study in one part of the province uh, with a local NGO, the Ministry of Health, MSF and UNICEF under the cell. Um, and so they get it signed off at the partner level and then at the local health actor level and by all of the local actors to make sure that they're really engaged and ready to use the evidence and that they've engaged on uh, what the study is. And so they're, they're already thinking about how they can use this evidence beforehand. The data collection and analysis is done on site. Um, and then there's multiple presentations across uh, different levels and partners uh, and all the different actors involved in the research. So for example, if we collect data with women's associations, uh, presenting back to women's associations for the co-development of recommendations. And co-development of recommendations will happen differently across different actors and they're shared across different actors to facilitate also um, a greater reflection. So when one person sees what others are doing or what they've co-developed as action, it might motivate and engage uh, further actions. These are also all tracked uh, by recommendation, by study, by location over time, um, and by disease or outbreak response, et cetera. Uh, so an example of how this is used, we have an example from the Red Cross in cholera um, with um, a money shell. And we have another example um, from the most recent Ebola outbreak in, in, uh, in Beni uh, from Gaffer Gamina, who is the lead of the response with UNICEF. me. So, um, and finally, I mean, another way that we also really support in um, IOA initiatives in countries is, is reinforcing this like uh, capacity building and training, which I'll speak a little bit more. So uh, this is an example from uh, Dr. Jacques, uh, who is the head of the IOA cell in Guinea. Um, and so just a, a, a little um, exchange with him as well.
And so, of course, what this shows as well is that it's all very different. I mean, Iowa approach is, is about being adapted to countries, to context. It's, it's a partnership. It's a better way of using evidence. Um, but this only really works if we're flexible to countries, provinces, and partners in country. So to give you some examples of how the IOA partnership and approaches can really work. So first is kind of, I think, the most commonly known, uh, which is our IOA cell. So this might be set up for a big or a new emergency. It's about a full-time focus on one disease. Um, we work via pillars or commissions. Um, there's rapid data turnaround. So we might be producing analyses within 24, 48, 72 hours daily meetings, sometimes two, three times a day. So examples of this would be an Ebola outbreak response uh, cell. Another might be for an IOA for smaller outbreaks, public health emergencies. So this might be collaborative partnerships, always under the Ministry of Health, using IOA methods, but maybe not having a cell structure. Um, so you would go into an area where you have, for example, malnutrition and bring together all the different actors working on all of the different types of data that might influence malnutrition. So gendered context data, um, program data, uh, surveillance data, DHS2 data, bringing that all together, looking at one um, disease, having potentially collaborative workshops, but maybe not having the daily meetings uh, and to deal with uh, that particular topic. Another option um, is setting up an IOA uh, for improved rapid response within the Ministry of Health. So this is something, for example, that we have started in the DRC is working with the, the DHS2 data and the Ministry of Health to support their capacity to use that as an early warning. And so then when they typically send out an epi or surveillance team to look at a situation like a measles or meningitis outbreak, instead of sending out just that team, they would have an integrated outbreak analytics team that would go and look holistically, that would support that integrated analysis right away. Uh, and that's really then based on a request from the Minister of Health to go, okay, can we have a rapid deploy team that is already integrated uh, for a particular um, outbreak? And that's reinforcing something already within the system. And finally, it's we have a topic-based IOA. So for example, uh, supporting countries and partners in um, a look at a public health or outbreak question using an IOA lens. So you might bring together different actors and data sources, but you'd have one key question and it might not be completely over the disease or the disease transmission. So a really common one right now is, you know, an IOA lens to uh, that COVID-19 vaccination uh, engagement or programming, which is actually the topic of our first IOA field exchange, um, which has been published this week. Um, so why did this approach work? Um, so again, based on uh, this, uh, welcome Trust and FCVO funding that we received in January 2020 uh, through GORN and UNICEF. Uh, we were able to really uh, conduct an analysis of what 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 works. Um, so first is inclusivity in study and survey designs and all of the questions. So the people who are using the data are involved um, not just at national level but at local level. There's already a buy-in and a reflection on how they're going to use the data. Uh, there's already a field and service-based approach. So we're addressing the questions that are required. We're checking that the tools do address the questions that are required. Um, and we're flexible to respond to what are the requests. Um, and we take the time to ask how and, and, and what will, will this data be used for? Um, really ensuring that there are adaptive approaches for information sharing. This is something that we've really grown to learn over the last three years um, is that it, every person will need a different type of data or a different way that that's presented. And we need to be flexible and adaptive and ready to do that in multiple ways. So PowerPoints, emails, one-to-one -one sessions, meetings, workshops, um, ensuring that you, you only present information that is potentially relative to particular groups when they have limited time, um, making sure that when we present at very, very community levels, uh, that information is also adapted, uh, language is appropriate, medium of communication is appropriate as well. Um, the approach of co-development of actions and recommendations. So this does seek, I mean, it's not perfect, um, but to remove power imbalances as, as well. Uh, so it's not just about a top-down approach. Again, ensuring that those who are involved uh, in studies are also involved in the co-development of recommendations at the end, um, that there is a participative action process happening um, and that these are not coming from uh, top-down studies uh, analyzed far from the communities um, and then recommendations being emailed out. It's really a, a, an operational process. Um, and that the research teams that we work with often come from programmatic backgrounds, so they can also suggest and engage with programs more easily. 
And finally, and one of the most important, of course, is that there's been no branding, no ego. We're here in service. So we seek to have a neutral branding, no logos, and also being ready to say, if somebody else is doing data collection or a particular study type, why not promote the use of that data that's already there as opposed to insisting on doing our own study? So uh, we've seen this a lot with things like perception surveys around COVID and just recognizing there's so much data out there. How do we facilitate better use of the data that does exist rather than just everybody collecting their own? Um, and all of this, again, being very field-based and, and uh, terrible word, but on the ground in country. And so this is an example of that. So that was Matthias, um, again, uh, demonstrating the importance of having field base. And this is Dr. John Combe, who was the incident manager of the Ebola response most recently, and also worked as field incident manager of during the 10th Ebola outbreak across many locations. And so how does this look then when we talk about kind of a global partnership? What is what is the objective to have this undergone at a global level with the, the core team uh, agencies there below? First is to really promote and strengthen um, a transdisciplinary understanding of outbreak dynamics um, for an improved, appropriate, more accountable outbreak response. Um, to be able to provide a, adapted context and country specific support to partners to conduct IOA uh, in, in country, community, province. Uh, and, and finally, to really create a community of practice where IOA can be shared and capitalized um, and used to support partners in their adaptation and um, application in multiple outbreak contexts. So again, uh, not forcing a particular mold, but facilitating and supporting access to be able to do what works best uh, for the different partners and ministries of health and country. And so how do we do this from a global level and, and how can GORM partners be, be more involved? Uh, the first is of course, human resources support. Um, what does that look like? Uh, that might be deployment. So teams that are deployed to the Ministry of Health uh, to set up IOA cells. It might also be deployment to provide hands-on uh, really in-depth technical training. Um, it also might be a support to your teams or partners that are already in country to engage and contribute to IOA. So really uh, being ready to pick up the gilet and engage in, uh, in collaborative uh, analytics. Uh, the other might be through providing technical guidance and analytic support remotely. Um, so an IOA cell backup support. This has been ongoing um, since 2019 where, for example, we have had not only support on running R and epidemiological analyses or statistical analysis, but also receiving support from partners such as Harvard Humanitarian Initiative and CDC Atlanta on running analysis on um, knowledge attitudes, community practice uh, surveys from distance. So that kind of support is also possible remotely. The other thing is just review of technical tools and guidance and it being available to do ad hoc uh, support as requested. We have a, a massive Google Drive um, online of all kinds of tools and training that are available in Word and hopefully easy to access. So also facilitating that kind of support. 
Um, another option is through workshops and training packages. So um, we have live workshops on how to set up IOA or focusing on specific IOA approaches. So for example, uh, how to really monitor and set up a tool that monitors the use of evidence across an outbreak. Um, there might also be training packages on IOA approaches to key themes, um, such as uh, vaccination engagement or um, how to how to look at the broader impacts of COVID on, on women and children. And these are not things that are, again, uh, top down. So the opportunity on these training packages could be provided by country experience or interviews. And um, it's an opportunity to share tools, multi-language webinars. Uh, we have uh, a YouTube channel, so you can see the different channels that are on there now. Um, and finally, of course, through Knowledge Exchange. So we have an IOA working group, um, which is, been operational as mentioned since June 2020, and that's twice a month. Uh, so participation or contribution to topics, uh, to debate, to work collaborative. The, the working group is really there to support uh, partners um, and as a service as well. And so it's you know anybody who would want to join or ask for support from that group. That that's also what we're there for. Um, again, accessing or sharing examples through the YouTube channel. Um, so we have local researchers presenting study findings or presenting ways of working, Ministry of Health, et cetera, as well, uh, to be able to promote and learn from each other. Uh, we have our IOA field exchange, which is up on the screen. Uh, so this is our first, it will come out quarterly. Um, and it's really an opportunity for uh, those working in different country programs uh, to demonstrate examples of IOA approaches across particular themes um, that don't have to be academically published. Um, we want to really encourage Ministry of Health, local NGO, all kinds of partnerships to, be able to demonstrate examples uh, and to learn from each other. And that's an opportunity to do so. So um, also reaching out and engaging on that. Uh, and finally, there's things like support on management in terms of website tools, um, all of that kind of data management or knowledge management, information management um, is also something that is, is a great need and support for us right now. Um, so that's it from my side. Uh, we really do welcome any questions and uh, those are our contacts there. And thank you very much for the time.